Okay, Sira, thanks very much for coming on the show today. I recently read a kind of a number of articles that you had a hand in on Venezuela analysis, all about the communes in Venezuela. Was this a part of a project that you've been working on? Uh, hi, Tom. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. So, yes, we've been working. I have been working in Venezuela analysis, but also in general as my commitment to the Bolivarian process and to communal movement. I have been working on a series of articles, interviews really, but also articles about uh, communal organization. The, the project is called Communal Resistance and uh, Working Class Resistance in the context of the U.S. blockade. Basically, one of the interesting things about Venezuela, one of the marvelous things about the Bolivarian Revolution, is that it's a revolution where people, in its early years, it was a revolution about talking, about hearing each other, about building together. It was, a, of course, a revolution, as probably all our listeners know, that was premised on participative and protagonic democracy. When when you say protagonic democracy, what do you mean by that? That's a that's a phrase people might know. Sure. Uh, so basically, uh, Chavez, when he began to think about the way to transform the society, this was around in a text that that's called the Blue Book Libro Azul from around uh, 1991, 1992. In this text, he premises the project, the transformation of the society on participative, which would be obvious, and protagonistic democracy, basically making the people the protagonist, the, the center, the epicenter of the revolution. So that is kind of like the main umbrella for the Bolivarian process. It's a process that is where democracy, but of course not liberal bourgeois democracy, but a true democracy based on the people's needs and on the people's desires, and ultimately and the socialist reorganization of society, that is what drives the whole process. So that is a little bit of like, kind of like the framework of the Bolivarian process. You know, like in the first years of the Bolivarian process, people were really, really had a forefront stage in the revolution. And in the latest years, because of the U.S. blockade, the sanctions, which are really, truly criminal, and we can probably talk about it later, but also because of other kind of like internal reconfirmations of the process, we have seen that the actors and the people who are transforming society are becoming somewhat invisibilized. So Chris Gilbert, uh, who's the person I've been working on this project with, and myself, we decided that since we have a commitment to the Bolivarian process, to the origins of the Bolivarian process, to the communal transition towards socialism, and since the voice of those who are building the transitions are not being heard so much these days, that we should uh, focus, basically we focused all of the year 2022, on visiting different communes, building a narrative built on the testimonials of the people who are transforming society. So that's a little bit of the framework on the project. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I, I read in, kind of in detail, I like, kind of focused on two different uh, communes that you've described. One of them was in Caracas called El, El Panal, the Beehive. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that commune and how it operates? Sure, I'll tell you about that commune, but maybe I should tell you a little bit before what is a commune, no? So. Let's let's start from the beginning. When Chavez proposes to build, Chavez and the Venezuelan people commit themselves to socialism, which is around 2006. Basically, Chavez begins, and this is, mind you, in a context, in a global context, where it's after the fall of the East Bloc. So socialism has become like something of the past. So Chavez around 2006 brings back, brings forth again the project of socialism. Really, really extraordinary. And I guess I think that the whole global left is somewhat indebted to, to Chavez and to the Bolivarian process for this. So around 2006, he brings up the project of socialism, but uh, he talks about 21st century socialism. And basically, 
One could ask, what is 21st century socialism? I mean, socialism is one thing. But basically what Chavez is doing is recognizing that while the East Bloc socialist projects had many virtues, they also had uh, some limitations, particularly the question of democracy. Uh, Chavez is uh, thinking about, we are talking about around 2006, and he's in a, in a very lively conversation with Ispan Menceros, the Hungarian philosopher, who had reflected on the permanence of the metabolism of capital in the Soviet system, in the East Bloc system. So Chavez is thinking about the need to build a socialist society, but that democracy, of course, as has, you know, like for Marx, democracy and, and socialism or communism were not two separate things. And so Chavez is thinking about reincorporating the idea of a substantive democracy to the socialist project. That's interesting and that actually has a great impact on the Bolivarian process. But the moment in which this idea of a socialism that will be truly democratic and from the grassroots, let's say that the moment where it really happens, the moment in which it it becomes a theorized proposal is around 2009, when Chavez begins to talk about the communes. So what are the communes? Technically... We could say that a commune is the aggregation of a, a few communal councils of 5 to 20 to 25 communal councils. Communal councils are also a Bolivarian and Chavista initiative that gets going around 2006, which are basically territorial governments, governments in the barrios, in the, in the countryside, that deal with that try to address the problems, specifically the structural problems, like, I don't know, like a road that has a problem or a school that has a problem. And collectively and as in an assembly way, people decide how to, to solve these problems. Now, the commune goes further. Commune again around, again around 2009, that's when the proposal is, comes to the fourth. Uh, the commune goes further in the sense that the commune not only proposes that the people in their territory, people locally, will democratically in an assembly decide how to solve the problems that they face day to day. The commune has at its epicenter the transformation not only of the territory, but it also has at its epicenter the economic reorganization of society. So communes, while they may be the aggregation of 5 to 15 to 20 communal councils, actually communes tend to have social property, co collective social property. They take all the decisions in, in an assembly manner. In the assembly, you decide what you are going to produce, how you are going to produce, and what you are going to do with the excellent, with the surplus, with the with the surplus in the production. So they are profoundly democratic spaces where you begin to, at a small scale, reorganize society in a socialist manner. So that's what, uh, that's a little bit of an introduction to what a commune would be. So I kind of remember now, forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, I remember, I think, hearing Chavez talking and he said that I think it might have been with, when he was talking about in dialogue, his own dialogue with Fidel Castro. And he was saying, you know, Castro was like a communist or a socialist or whatever, and that Chavez considered himself a social democrat. I, I don't know if I'm misrepresenting that, but did he change his views? Did, they, did he become more radical over time? Chavez did become more radical over time. I don't think he actually called himself a social democrat per se. But you could easily say that his the early years of Chavez, it was somewhat the government was so, somewhat social democratic, which is actually really extraordinary in the periphery context to even try to do a push forth reforms. This is important to know because like reforms obviously in the periphery in the global south, the exercise and the domination of capital 
and of imperialism means that well in the global north you all have enjoyed uh, social welfare states uh, in the peripheries that's all, almost impossible because of the because value flows from the south to the north so there's even there's no no wiggle room for the bourgeoisie to establish a social democratic system in the global south and that wiggle room of course in the global north i am fully aware that in the global north when there's a social democratic uh, or welfare state uh, that's because the people struggle but also because the bourgeoisie can have that wiggle room because of imperialism uh, values flowing from south to north but going back to the issue of social democracy or reformism it's true that in the in the early years of the bolivarian process basically the government focused on giving people basic stuff that they needed like access to education and access to healthcare through the missions with the cuban doctors access to food at uh, lower prices and even access to housing so those we could say we could easily say that Uh, just focusing on those elements and not on the full reorganization of society those might be we could call them social democratic reforms however in their context i think they are they are potentially revolutionary reforms so yeah uh, the, then however your question is did chavez advance or did was the bolivarian process in a context that did Ch was chavez a socialist when he came to power and then around 2006 proposed socialism or not and chavez it's it's a long story actually but chavez had contact with socialists and communists even when he was in an army officer and his brother adan was actually in the prb prb which was a revolutionary insurgent movement in the 1960s and 1970s so chavez did have as an army officer contacts with left guerrilla movements and not only that not only did he have contact but also some of the people in the the movement in the PRV which is an interesting movement because it they always had the uh, intention of trying to co-opt military officers or military people in general for the revolutionary process which generally doesn't happen in other places and we could see that history said that tactic was right at least here in Venezuela because in the end Chavez comes out of the military ranks but the PRB different people from the PRB actually gave books to Chavez to read so he was reading different historical figures uh, he was very committed to the history of Venezuela to the liberation the emancipation of Venezuela the independence process that happened about uh, 200 years ago but he was also reading books within the marxist canon so he was no it would be wrong to say that he had not had connections with the the hard left but when chavez came to power his first objective was to basically the economic reorganization of society was not an objective he was aiming towards the democratization of society now because he and the bolivarian process because there was a truly a tr real commitment to democracy the re a real commitment to grassroots uh, to the democratization of society and to grass grassroots and to popular power if you make it if you make true on your commitment to it i think that eventually it has necessarily to lead you to socialism and that's i think what happened that's a good way of understanding the situation so we could say that he is pushing for a radical democratization of society not thinking so much about the democratization of society in economic terms and eventually when you go full circle it comes to the full democratization of society in political and economic terms which is what socialism is and that happens around 2006 and then it becomes a full proposal around 2009 with the commune so in what sense then is the commune let's say just the commune movement or whatever we want to call it in what sense is it a grassroots phenomenon and in what sense is it kind of like a, a state-led phenomenon 
It's definitely a grassroots uh, phenomenon, although there is a relationship with a uh, with a government that is sometimes more uh, sympathetic and sometimes less sympathetic to the grassroots and to the communal movement. So basically, while the proposal comes from the proposal of communes itself comes from Chavez, Venezuelan society has is a society that there's a long history of rebellions and of not the peoples, the Indian peoples that inhabited this territory, the Caribes, these were peoples that were, we could say, organized in communal, prim primitive communal communist organizations. So these were peoples that uh, had, when the colonizers arrived, they had a rather anarchist form of organization, horizontal uh, forms of organization. And while that was more than 500 years ago, you can still see it in the society. So there is a kind of like rebellious and I would even say anarchist and reivindicating anarchism here and, and an anarchist kind of like drive within Venezuelan society. So the participation of everybody is something that Venezuelan people kind of like take for granted. Also in the 90s, in the 1990s in Venezuela, you know, like the left had been inhabited by communist parties in, in Latin America, like formal communist parties, Soviet bloc communist parties, and other parties like the PRV. But the most visible left had been inhabited by the communist party in Venezuela. Comrades, of course. But it was a party that was not so committed to democracy around the 90s in Venezuela. There was very interesting and very widespread movement of barrio assembly organizations. So while it is in 2009 that one person specifically, Chavez, proposes to go towards socialism via the commune, grassroots organization is very much, grassroots democratic forms of organization are very much part of Venezuelan society. So no, communes are not top down, although they come from as we were saying, from the proposal itself comes from Chavez. Communes inhabit a society, Venezuela, Venezuelan communes inhabit a society that is, of course, that has a government that is progressist. And they live in a, a relationship of cooperation and that with the government. With Chavez, the communes lived in a relationship of cooperation and tension and with uh, in the present too, there's relationships of cooperation and the government, the state, and and these grassroots organizations that are really the future of Venezuelan society, which become communes. So, when you say cooperation and tension, could you flesh out the, those two aspects? So, well, let's begin with cooperation. Communes inhabit. There's a set of popular power laws that were uh, set in place in 2012. Well, it varies. I mean, there's f five popular power laws, 2010, 2011, 2012. These laws basically organize the communal system. So obviously laws come from a parliamentary, from a parliament, from the National Assembly in our case. And while these laws were made in consultation with the people who would be building the communes, it's also true that they come from a state structure, the parliament. Also, these laws actually open for state support or mandate, actually, state support of the communes. So econo I'm talking about economic state support of the communes. So that would be kind of like the cooperation. And indeed, the most consolidated communes like El Maizal, and in Lara State, and El Panal, in Caracas, and the Che Guevara Commune in the Andean region, they have indeed received important resources from the Venezuelan government. Now, when we talk about tension, of course, communes, communes are kind of like the base cell which is aimed to destroy the existing bourgeois state. Chavez said many times that Venezuela still had a bourgeois state, uh, basically a capitalist state. 
So this means that uh, since the communes are the space from which we as a society will be in a new future, a new just future, a new socialist future, there naturally have to be tensions with the existing institutionality. So when you look at the, the present situation, for instance, in the last three days, there was a, a, a Congress of Communal Economy here, held here in Caracas, in which about, I don't know, 100 communards and state officials participated. This was organized by the Ministry of Communes. And in that space, there was an interesting debate in which state officials talked and also communards talked. And it was very interesting because some of the communards uh, made pretty uh, tough criticisms of the government in terms of how the limited resources that the government has, which granted they are limited because of the U.S. blockade, but that limited resources that there are are not being channeled in the direction of communes, which is, the, you know, like the aspiration. If you are trying to build a new society, obviously you don't build the new society with your nails. You also need resources to build new means of production and to reorganize and make reorganize the the economy and the, the society to address the needs in the territory. So in this very space, you saw people from the different communes actually making, as I was saying, pretty harsh criticisms of the state officials who uh, state officials who were there, including the minister who was there. And this has always been the case. There has always been a situation of cooperation and tension between the government and the communal movement. Sometimes it's been more intense. In fact, right now, the contradictions have been lowered. But about two years ago, uh, three years ago, the contradictions between the communal movement and the government were quite intense. For instance, in Simon Planas, in where Maisal is, one of the most uh, emblematic communes, the main spokesperson of that commune launched himself as, as a major candidate, major old candidate, and he won. But he was not allowed to become the major on a technicality. He went on a last party that was not the official party, and not on the PSUV ticket, but on, on another party's ticket. And he was not allowed to become the major of the city. It's because there were plenty of contradictions. That commune around that time, for instance, had the Venezuelan law, constitution rather, and the land law allows for the people to take vacant lands and vacant productive spaces by the organized community. An organized community can take vacant land and vacant productive spaces. And so El Maisal Commune had actually expropriated the state, the government of a pig farm, for instance, and of a university campus, a vacant university campus that was on the territory of the commune. It was absolutely legitimate what El Maisal did, but some officials, quite a few government officials, were not too happy to be seeing these feisty people take state, vacant state property for the communalization. So that's that specific case can bring to the fore the kind of contradictions that have emerged throughout the Bolivian process. I would say that right now there's a rather, a pretty good, it's not a very tensioned moment, but we will go back to moments where tension reemerges and then there will be moments when there's more or less tension. It's going to be a constant until the communes become hegemonic in our society. So uh, talking about scale then, like what is the scale of the commune movement at the moment? How many communes, what kind of size typically are they? What percentage of the economy is linked into the commune movement, would you estimate? Okay, so the first thing is that we should be very honest about this. While there are formally thousands of communes, registered communes, there is a, a state institution that legalizes communes, gives them a number, registers them, etc. While there are thousands of registered communes, I would say that maybe 
there are hundreds of really existing communes in Venezuela. And when I say a really existing commune, I mean a really existing commune where they are regularly meeting, taking the decisions together, collectively running the means of production and socially distributing the value produced. So I would say there are hundreds, and I would say hundreds, and I would say in the low hundreds, to be even more honest. Each commune is about, they vary a lot in size, but communes may range from, I don't know, from 2,000 to 20,000 people in a commune's territory. That would be the range that they would give you. It's a rough estimate. And what percentage of the of the economy do they make up? It's hard to, it's really hard. I'm not going to give you a number. It's really hard to, to measure it because obviously in communes, we cannot use the liberal bourgeois kind of like GDP. Measuring like a, yeah, GDP and things like that do not work for, for our context. But I would say, but the truth is that I, I cannot give you a number, but I would say it's a small part of, of the economy. It does, I'm sure it doesn't reach 10%, and I would be surprised if it reached uh, 5% of the Venezuelan economy. I mean, I would, I would like to add to that that communes are actually the future. They are, they are actually not really, not really, truly the total of the Venezuelan society has not been hegemonized and organized by communes yet. But the communes that work really are showing that the transformation of the society via the communes is possible. Okay, so maybe we'll chat a bit about some of the communes then that you, you've been to. So one of them I mentioned earlier is El Panal, the, mm-hmm. the beehive set up in the barrios in uh, western Caracas. Do you want to talk, give us a little overview of what life is like in, in El Panal? Sure, this is a commune that is very, very close to my heart. I'm actually, this commune uh, has uh, an educational initiative that's called the Pluriversidad, and I'm one of the professors that, that teaches there. And I have had a long time commitment to this uh, commune. It's in the Barrio of 23 de Enero, which is a working class barrio in Caracas with a long history of insurgency in the 60s and 70s. The guerrilleros often took a safe house in 23 de Enero. People in 23 de Enero have generally been left. They have actually fought against the pol- police entering their territory. In any case, it's a barrio with a long history of left rebellions. This uh, commune, El Panal, basically some communes, not all communes, but some communes basically are built on priorly existing organizations. And the priorly existing organization at El Panal is called Alexis Vive. Alexis Vive is an organization that was created around 2001, 2002, with a very charismatic leader whose name is Robert Longa. And this organization is a grassroots organization, but it's, it's a, rather, I should say, it's an organization with a committed with, to the grassroots, but it's it's itself a kind of like a vanguard. They say sometimes Marxist-Leninist organization, although certainly their interpretation of Marxist-Leninism is from the South, and they are very Gramscian and very Guevarist as well. So, this organization has a long trajectory of work in the barrio, in 23 de Enero. And in fact, they were an organization that one of the first things they did was to displace the drug gangs from the territory. And of course, they did this with a political principle, which is winning over the, the hearts and minds of the people before violence. But to displace drug gangs from a territory, you might have to opt for, for other mechanisms at the time. But So this organization was able to get rid of the drug gangs from the territory very successfully and actually very peacefully, although not always peacefully. And this indeed won the hearts and minds of the people in the territory. This is, this is an organization that is, of course, you know, when Chavez came to her and after a while they, they became very committed to the Bolivarian process and to the Chavista project. Around 2006, 
remember I said that in 2009, Chavez proposed the communalization of society. But already in 2006, when Chavez was talking about communal councils, which are the first base organization that will later, when aggregated, become a commune. But around 2006, in the people from Alexis Vive actually built an arch in the entrance of the territory that says, Bienvenidos a la Comuna, El Panal 2021. Welcome to the 2021 El Panal Commune. So they were already thinking about the communalization of society before Chavez himself talked about it. So we can say, in fact, we can say that El Panal is the first commune in Venezuela. One of the, reading the articles, the Alexei Vibe Patriotic Force, the vanguard organization you're talking about, their inspirations, I wrote them down here, were the Merida Communards, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, the Paris Commune of the Soviets. So it's not typically what you would associate with like so much a Leninist or an, um, a, an ML model, but it's it seems nearly quite a, nearly anarchist or councilist inspired as well. I mean, I think that absolutely. Basically, the council model is super important. Uh, it's, it's a super important reference for these organizations, for these communal organizations, and specifically the historical references that they look to at Alexis Vive, that patriotic force, they are experimentations in assembly organization. So indeed, they are not, they, their commitment is fostering popular power. Now, it is a vanguard organization because it's a cadre organization, a small cadre organization. And within the organization itself, it is organized by the logic of democratic centralism. So the organization itself is an organization that has the structure of a Marxist-Leninist party. But the organization is committed towards, it's committed with the democratization of society. It's committed to the assembly solution of societal problems. So it's a well, internally, and the internal organization also has to do with the fact that when the organization emerged, it had to also have kind of like a military structure because they were fighting against the drug gangs. And so it has that kind of like moment of origin and also the reference of Marxism-Leninism and the structure of a Marxist-Leninist organization. And the cadres are cadres that respond to kind of like a hierarchy within, within the organization. But in fact, they are promoting, and this may seem contradictory, but when you are on the territory, you really understand how this is working. And in fact, they are promoting the assembly organization of, of society. So indeed, they look at the Paris Commune, they look at the Soviets, and they look also at the Chinese communes to understand how to organize the new society. It may seem contradictory that an organization with a Marxist-Leninist internal structure is promoting an assembly type, or a more anarchist, we could say, communist, a libertarian communist uh, form of organization of society. But actually, the organization itself talks about the need to dissolve itself into the communal organization once the communal organization has is really robust. So their objective, for now, they are there. They are part of the commune, of course. They are fundamental in the commune, but there's a lo a lots of other actors in the in the commune. And eventually the organization has to dissolve. When, once the commune is consolidated, the organization must dissolve into the communal organization, the grassroots democracy of the process. Yeah, so it's quite a kind of, you know, kind of syncretic solution to a problem. Y yes, I mean, basically they are building, or we are, we are building a new society and the context may be changing the objectives of how to build a new society are becoming clearer and that means that the different structures may have to leave cohabitate spaces for a period of time 
but ultimately the objective of the Alexis Vive organization of the patriotic force is the ultimate objective is to foster the new society through assemblyary means. And in fact, that is how I, I should say something. The decisions in the territory of El Panal, which is where this this organization, this vanguard organization exists, the decisions in El in El Panal commune are actually taken in an assembly. They are not taken by a few cadres of Marxist Leninist organizations. Actually, the important decisions about how to run, what to do, uh, how to organize politically, how to defend the territory, etc. Those organizations, those decisions are made in an assembly. And the last thing that I should say in this regard is that the assembly in a commune, going back to how a commune organizes, the maximum governing body of a commune is the assembly. And everybody can participate, in the, anybody in the territory can and should participate in the assembly where the t- decisions are taken. But also communal councils have spokespeople. And very recently, uh, well, actually in July at El Panal Commune, they had elections for their spokespeople. And the participation was huge. The participation was higher than in the latest national elections in Venezuela. So they have spokespeople. These spokespeople actually are kind of like the the grassroots organizers. And in the communal assemblies where all the important decisions are run through, sometimes proposals are brought to the assembly. Sometimes they review the accounts collectively in the assembly. Sometimes they take decisions about things like, you know, like the processes of living together, you know, like uh, neighbors cannot make so much noise after such an hour and things like that. So all these things, day to day, quotidian things and economic and political and other sorts of, of decisions are taken through the assembly at El Panal Commune. It's not the cadres of the Alexis Vive that take those decisions. The cadres of the Alexis Vive organization are just kind of like the promoters of this project. You said in, in, in the article it was 44% you'd written was the participation in the coming elections. That's incredibly high for a local, like a local election anywhere in the world, I would think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but also that was higher than the latest parliamentary elections that we had in Venezuela. So, right. so it shows that the society, the local, the commune is not a... It's a real thing. It's not a... It's legit. Kind of it's, it has legitimacy. legitimacy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not absolutely. just a, an activist group. Doing and stuff. I would say that not everywhere, uh, but in this particular case, El Panal is the hegemonic political force. Is the hegemonic... The, no, I should say this in a different way. At El Panal, in the territory of El Panal, the commune is understood to be the main force for political and economic organization. It is not always the case. In some communes that are very consolidated, like another commune that we visited in Barcelona, which is a city in the east of the country where they have a really beautiful project. They are focusing on the fifth strategic objective of Chavez, which was nature and the continuation of life. The environmental strategic of, of Chavez in the in the homeland plan, El Palan de la Patria. So in this commune where they are focusing on recycling, etc., they are in a territory where if you go there, the people like the most committed, the people in the, I don't know, if you ask some pe- people in the street, they know about the commune and they may vote for for spokespeople and they may once in a while go to an assembly, but you probably cannot say yet that the project, the communal project, is hegemonic in that territory. There's another commune, which is called El Maizal, which is really important. And in that territory, we could say that, indeed, the project of the commune is hegemonic in the territory. How does the say in El Panal, for example, how do they interact with the police? Do they self-police or what goes on? It depends on different spaces, right? I mean, let's not make this universal about the communes, but at El Panal, the police does not go in. Uh, They have their own internal security. The police, historically in Venezuela and generally in the global south, 
uh, is just horrible. It's very violent. Um, and cor- I mean, of course, everywhere the police is horrible, excuse me. But in the, <laughs> but in the global south, in the global south, the police tends to be more overtly violent, more blanketly overtly violent, and also more overtly corrupt. And also in Venezuela and in general, well, around the world, yeah, this is not something particular about Venezuela, the police is actually has real political objectives which are anti-popular. I mean, of course, the, I mean, what, what can I say? The police, wherever you are talking about the police, perhaps with the exception of Cuba, the police, the police is there to maintain the status quo. So I don't need to go any further into this. Specifically at El Panal, the police does not go in. The people themselves organized, maintain the peace in the territory. Um, that's in El Panal. There's other communes that are actually very consolidated communes, like El Maizal, where the police may not always be welcome, but they may have a little bit more freedom to move around. Yeah, and what is the crime statistics like? Because it looked from the photographs that uh, El Panal looked like it might be lower crime than non-commune run barrios Absolutely. in Caracas. Absolutely. I mean, it's really, it's a place where you can, you know, it might not be a good idea to bring out your phone out of your backpack in some other barrio in Caracas. Uh, you can, you know, you can do that in El Panal, and you know that nobody is going to snatch it away from you. Also, there's uh, big problems with uh, drug trafficking in some barrios of Caracas. Of course, that's not that doesn't happen in El Panal. So yes, there is. It's it is actually a peaceful place. It's, it's very noticeable when you go into the territory that you are in there. So, what kind of stuff do they get up to in the El Panal commune in Caracas? Well, basically, this is a commune that's growing very quickly, very fast. In 2020, actually, which was a very hard year world around, but particularly in Venezuela, because not only was there the pandemic, but also it was a very, the impact of the sanctions and the blockade was really, really harsh. So in 2020, Robert Longa, who's the, I guess, the natural leader of the commune and spokes commune, he declared year zero. It was the year of hunting, gathering, and recollection. Basically, they realized that, that they really had to focus, refocus on the economic side of it, and that the situation was critical. They had to focus on, survive, on surviving with the horizon of expanding their production. So in that very year, 2020, towards the end, they bought a few pigs, actually, they bought a few pigs to sell the meat. But uh, one of the pigs they bought was a sow, and she was pregnant. She had a, a litter, I guess, I don't know how you say it, with piglets. She had piglets, and that was kind of like the beginning of their, it was a spontaneous beginning of their pig farm. Right now they have a pig farm that's about 100 pigs. And it's interesting because this is in the middle of the city, you know, El Panal is in the middle of Caracas, and they have a pig style of about 100, a semi-industrialized pig style right now of about 100 pigs. And they use the Cuban method to keep the the pigs in the city, which is, a, it's called a deep bed. That's one of the areas. They have a fish farm, a rather a semi-industrialist fish farm too. They also have... A big, they're building a recycling enterprise in the neighborhood, the Mendes de Nero. And they have, right now, they're just opening a store that's called Pampanal, where they are going to sell some of their production to. And the actually, the oldest uh, production of El Panal, the oldest uh, means of production, it, it's basically a textile factory, a small textile factory. Well, I don't know if I would call it a textile factory. Basically, they make garments, T-shirts, clothing, etc. And one of the interesting things about, uh, for instance, the textile factory is that it's a socially owned textile factory. And basically, the surplus goes back to the community. So uh, part of, of the income 
goes, of course, to pay the workers. They all have the same wages. The enterprise is democratically run by the workers. They decide what to do with the set goes reinvested into the machines, whatever has to be kept. And one part of the surplus goes back to the community. And this is how basically communal enterprises are to be run. Communal enterprise implies that the community is the one who's going to receive uh, the accident or the surplus. And they work well. These are, these are actually rather efficient means of production. They are not large means of production, but they are efficient means of production. And they are basically the main source for the co commune to go on doing the care of the community that the commune always does. El Panel has two canteens. One of the canteens feeds about, feeds the workers of the commune, about 50 people. Another canteen feeds vulnerable people, about 140 people are fed by the commune. And all the social care of the community work is done out of the surplus of this work. One thing that I should highlight, and then I finish with this uh, little introduction about their production, is that uh, at El Panal commune, they are very conscious of not generating situations of clientelism. I don't know if this word is so commonly used in yeah. English. It's not like the commune is kind of like the reproduction of a client state. For the commune, care of the community that is done is always done with the objective of fostering a new, new political and, of course, economic relations in the territory. Yeah, so a question for you then on how they how they remunerate the workers there in the factory that we're going to discuss in a while. The kind of the the metallurgy, the metal factory workers, they they do it on like equal pay. Is it the same in El Panal commune? Yes, that is right. Basically, the pay of of the workers of the different means of production is equal pay. I mean, this is. Something that's almost never discussed, but indeed it's very interesting that it came to happen in a relatively spontaneous process in Venezuela in the Bolivian Revolution. The means of production that are either communal or worker-run, they generally, in, in the cases that I know, people, when there is a remuneration, because many of the people who are in a commune are not actually... This is something I should highlight. I mean, a Venezuelan commune is not like a Chinese commune, the Maoist Chinese communes, which, of course, they are experiences from which we could learn a lot. But in a Venezuelan commune, not everybody who lives in the communal territory is actually working full time in the commune. Many people have their normal jobs and then go, they go back to the commune. Maybe they participate in an assembly, in a meeting, or they do some work for the community. But the people who are in the communes, the people who work, uh, say, full-time on it, they get remunerations and their remunerations are equal. And that and happens spontaneously, as I said. It wasn't part of a debate. It just has happened that people understand that when you are building a new new should set, obviously it has to be based on, on equality. Right, yeah. It seems to be kind of a, a, a very natural, yet kind of a fundamentally important aspect of communal life that remuneration that pay you know it's a part of communism is the you know an egalitarian community that the pay scales are are flat is there ever issues around certain people thinking they're more productive wanting more pay than others is it even something that comes up well actually i should uh, say something at the textile workshop if uh, you put more, if you put beyond a certain amount of time and production, you actually get a plus. I actually forgot to mention that and it's important. So the textile workshop, I don't know if you work beyond whatever it's collectively agreed, there's a collective agreement should be produced and how much each producer should be producing. And if you actually go beyond, you will get a little bit of an extra. So there is, the wages are the same, but you might get an extra if you work a few more hours. But in my experience, there has, there are no in relation to the equal pay. These things are always debated in, in assemblies, in workers' assemblies. 
And yeah, there's no, I haven't seen evidence of conflict when it comes to this. Since we are talking about El Panal, and as I was telling you earlier, El Panal is, it's an initiative that's closely related to Alexis Vive, which is a more traditional, traditional political organization. And Alexis Vive has cadres that are, are tremendously committed and also make this, have the same wages as other workers. These cadres, actually, if you go to El Panal Commune in the morning, you will see them working. But if you go to El Panal at midnight, for some reason, you will see them working too. So these people are working about, I don't know, as far as I can see, they must be working like 20 hours a day. It, it's actually sometimes concerning. It's kind of like a tremendous sacrifice on these people's part to make this commune and to make it all work. And of course, at this time, when they are trying to make their means of production grow, you know, like this is a capitalist society. Don't be mistaken. Venezuela is a capitalist society. And the logic of the system is capitalist. On top of that, there's a blockade. The time when this commune is trying to really grow with, uh, thing, with the situation stacked against the project, frankly, that means that people have to work tremendous amount. And this is not only the case uh, uh, we are focusing in this conversation on El Panel commune, but in all the communes that we have visited, which is a which is a lot, and, and we know them well because we have we are doing this project, and this means like processes of immersion in these communes. The communars always work a tremendous amount, and sometimes it's actually concerning because it's kind of like a, a physical sacrifice that many of them are doing to push forth the communes. Pushing like that is not a long term strategy. Like, is there is there much burnout amongst the the kind of more active communards? Well, I mean, the thing is that the morale is very high in many of the communes. As you say, this is not eternally possible, and it's the body cannot stand this kind of intensity of work eternally, I mean, or like for years. Well, of course, in communes, there's always times when there's more intensity, and communes, there's times when there's less intensity. For instance, in a rural commune, there might be a, a time that's because of the, I mean, this is always happens with campesino life. There might be a time that's really, really intense and a time that's not so intense, but there's always the political work, which is on top of all the production work. So I think that people are used to periods of high intensity and periods of perhaps a little bit less intensity. How long is this going to go on? I don't know. The conversations are going within the, within the common art movement that there has to be, and this is actually important. In the relationship between the Venezuelan government and the communes, there's a relation of, co I think we were talking about it before, and there's a relation of cooperation and tension. And of course, the bourgeois state does not want the communes to, the bourgeois state, which is not the same thing as the government, but it's related to the government, does not want the communes to emerge. There are sectors within the government that are sympathetic, and some of them very sympathetic to the communes. But the truth is that if a growing sector of those of us who are involved with communes believe that there has to be a, I would use the word dispute, yes, a dispute uh, for part of the Venezuelan rent to make the communes work, to make the communes really work and grow. Because right now the communes are in a situation that I mean, some communes are growing, like El Panal, but they are in a permanent situation of crisis in, ter in economic terms. That's the truth. Because, well, it's a hegemonically capitalist society. So the, what we are working on in, is, is on a, what uh, some of us are saying is that the communes have to come together and demand a percentage of the national... Uh, state income. Of the state income, yeah, for the communes. And in that, of course, we are proposing what actually this is informally being talked about and it's informally being for now informally, hopefully we'll go to a more formal moment. It's being talked about demanding 5% of the national income and uh, it has to be self-run. It cannot be institutionally run. So communes have to be able to directly self-organize and manage those funds. And hopefully this will advance because communes have to come out of uh, this situation of precarity. And they are in the situation of precarity again for several reasons. They are a small part of the economy. They represent a small part of the economy. The overall economy is capitalist and communes are socialist, let's say, socialist exercises. And Chavez always say, said, a commune that's an island of socialism is destined to not succeed. 
Um, this is true. So communes have to come together, become stronger, and demand a part of the national income, not to get rich, of course, but to generate the conditions so that the new re social relations that are beginning to emerge in the communes can really fully bloom.